Good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Kalima. As Pratik mentioned, I'm the VP of Product Management here at Intertrust. I'm responsible for our data platform. And I've also been very closely involved in a lot of the uh, solutions work and application development we've been doing with customers in the renewable space. And so today I'll be sharing a bit about the Intertrust platform, a very quick history of Intertrust itself as an organization, uh, just in case you're not familiar with us. And then I'll be diving into our PowerBoard application and also some other solutions that we've developed on top of the Intertrust platform. Uh, so without further ado, I'll jump into my presentation here. And again, a, a quick introduction of Intertrust. So Intertrust is really about creating trusted services for the connected world. It was founded roughly 30 years ago, 1990 in Silicon Valley. That's where our headquarters are based, but we definitely have offices throughout the world, North America, Europe, Asia. Uh, we have a strong engineering presence in Estonia. Uh, we have a variety of private shareholders, including Philips, uh, Eon, Panasonic, uh, Origin Energy, World Innovation Lab, which is a Japanese fund that uh, uh, is very involved in uh, and has been a very good proponent of ours uh, in the Asia landscape and media. We have a expertise in security, privacy, and trust. Uh, everyone, well, not everyone, but people most likely know us from the work we've done in digital rights management. So a lot of work there protecting content in the media space, whether it be streaming movies, streaming music, that's really where Intertrust uh, has, has uh, pr proved its worth in the security space um, with a lot of engagements with uh, movie studios. And as you can see, uh, Panasonic and Sony being shareholders, all of the televisions that are produced in Japan have some of our technology in it to enable this trusted delivery of content. So that's really where a lot of our innovation and um, research and development has been focused. We do have a Turing Prize recipient on our staff. So there's a strong legacy in research and development and also just innovation. We're active now in numerous verticals, including energy, IoT, automotive, consumer electronics and media. And we have a few divisions within our uh, organization, the data platforms, which I'm involved with. We also have a secure systems division and our media solutions um, focusing on those, those DRM technologies. Uh, so jumping into the platform and one of the motivations and, and reasons why we developed the Intertrust platform, we see the data supply chain being becoming more and more important and having the ability to deliver data rapidly to engage and involve in data-driven innovations and improvements. Now we're seeing a lot of ecosystems emerge around data, um, you know, within the energy space, within insurance, within automotive, if you think about these domains, data is becoming increasingly important for innovation, for data-driven applications. Um, in the automotive space, for example, we see a lot of innovation in autonomous driving, right, which is ultimately very data-driven. But we're also seeing things like insurance companies get involved there where they can use telemetry from vehicles to determine if you're a good driver or not. And you know, this starts to cross into the territory where you're using personally identifiable information, there's sensitivity to using that data for these innovations, for these new business models. And really the Intertrust platform wants to address all of these different data friction points that we see emerging when these data providers or companies that are using data or producing data really wanna engage in these broader ecosystems. And so there's five friction points I've outlined here. The first is misaligned strategy. So in particularly in larger organizations, we see that different business groups typically have different motivations. There may be uh, specific solutions, specific technologies that are being deployed by these divisions to satisfy their business needs. And that's great, but what happens as a result is some of this data becomes siloed within those divisions. There's these technological and political boundaries that go up and without a strategy to really unify and bring all that data together, it can be quite difficult to actually unlock those silos and provide data to someone like an analyst or a data scientist who may want more of a horizontal view across the organization. So that misaligned strategy is uh, one of the key friction points. Another is legal risk. So we're seeing this evolving legal landscape regarding data ownership. What are data consumers uh, rights within uh, or to their data, how their data is used. 
do they provide consent for the use of their data, how it's processed? And so in the EU, there's GDPR, which states what the data subject rights are. You have to have consent for processing. You have to be transparent about how that data is being used. You have to talk about the subprocessors that you're providing data to, to deliver a number of services that may be consuming that data. And this is really an evolving landscape and we're seeing more and more legislation being introduced here in California. Now we have our CCPA. Uh, we're seeing other states looking to adopt similar data protection laws within the US. And you know, there's, there's more and more stories emerging now about GDPR fines that are being issued in the EU because of violations. So that's a legal risk, it's a financial risk, and it's very real. And it's, it's particularly applies to this personally identifiable information. So for using personal data, this can be a very touchy subject. Uh, supply chain risk is the third friction point here. So if you're an organization that has lots of data, but maybe you don't have data science skills within your organization. So you're gonna reach out to a service provider, a hot new AI company comes along, has the killer algorithm for your domain in order to train that model, in order to run that model, they're gonna require access to a large volume of data. So typically historical data in order to train the model, make it accurate, make it performance, and then operational data on an ongoing basis to actually produce whatever output that model um, is creating. And so this creates this supply chain risk. Can you trust those vendors that are coming in and, and want access to your data? There's value to the organization because the services that they provide can make, can, can increase efficiency, can create new opportunities. But again, there's a risk in handing that data over. And one of the examples I like to cite here is the Cambridge Analytica that was using Facebook APIs. There was a contractual agreement about how data should be used and how data should not be stored. But ultimately Cambridge Analytica violated that uh, contract. And as a result, Facebook uh, was subject to a lot of reputational damage. It was a huge story. Um, and, and it's an example here of some of that supply chain risk. The final two items here are more about the data and the technical challenges. So just data usability. What is this data? What data do I have? How do I discover this? Do I know the provenance of this data? Is there, are there different schemas, uh, different data sources, different taxonomies? The way that data is represented perhaps in one business division is not the same as the other. So how do you make this data usable, discoverable, um, and, and also communicate the quality of that data to data consumers? Because if you have large volumes of this data, if people can't find it, if they can't understand it, it's gonna be very difficult to use. And it's, it's even, um, I would say more frustrating because now you know that data is there, but you can't actually use it. So the data usability is a big challenge and then just technical barriers. Where is this data stored? We're seeing a lot of hybrid cloud environments. Sometimes some data is on-prem, some data has been moved into the cloud. Some of it is in a data warehouse. Some of it is in a, a data lake house. So we're seeing a lot of technologies as uh, we have legacy systems and more modern systems, contemporary architectures emerging, pulling all of this data together can really be a technical challenge. And so that's one of the, uh, the items that the platform looks to address as well. And so what is the InterTrust platform? It's really this key suite of technologies that's helping organizations to streamline their data operations. We wanna provide trust in that data. We wanna provide interoperability with that data, not just the data types, but also where data lives and how people are consuming it. And we wanna provide collaboration so that all of the different stakeholders can get at this data, use the data within their work in a very agile and effective way. And so the technologies underlying the platform, some of the components that we introduce, the first is data virtualization. So we don't need to duplicate or migrate data to a centralized warehouse. The platform can create a logical view of all of your data sets. And then on top of that, we can impose data governance. And so the ability to dictate who has access to what sets of data, um, this includes very granular fine, fine grain control over row and column based uh, levels. So we can introduce restrictions and even some of those can be dictated on some of the attributes of the caller. So if I have a particular, if I belong to a particular organization or maybe I'm a device manufacturer, uh, I can only see the data that, uh, my that belongs to my devices or being produced by my devices. That's an example of a restriction that we can impose on a consumer of the data using our gov data governance. 
And then finally, this secure execution where we can bring workloads into the platform, run them within their own containers. So um, isolated resources, compute and memory. And those programs can run on the data that's being governed by the platform. Now, why is that important? When that data custody friction point, when we're delivering data to these third-party organizations from service providers, that data is typically delivered in some mechanism where you send it over via an S3 bucket, or we've even heard cases of people handing over thumb drives of data. Once you do that, you've lost custody of that data. You no longer control it. In this model, we can bring those workloads onto the platform. That data actually never leaves the platform, but those processes and services can run on the platform in order to generate whatever the, the data product is. And so that's a very powerful tool for retaining custody of your data and not exposing yourself to some of this supply chain risk. There's two complementary services here on the right that I wanna note. And the first is an audit service. So everything that takes place in the platform is recorded as an immutable audit record. Now that includes requests for data, that includes activities like logging into the platform, authenticating. Uh, so we record a record of everything and that's very useful for compliance or audit logs, or if you're subject to regulation where you have to uh, display or prove how data was used, who was granted data access, when, by whom, this is where the audit service can come in to help you meet those compliance regulations. And then finally, the time series database, which actually plays an important role in the work we've done with PowerBoard. It's specifically built for IoT data. It's a multi-tier architecture. So we have a hot store and a cold store uh, as a part of this solution. And it's a very cost-effective, very performant time series database where we can store these IoT event records pretty much designed for uh, time-stamped data where we can provide uh, and service real-time applications. So if you want to look at data as it's coming in as a stream, we can provide hot store access, but then also we can allow you to very cost-effectively store all of that time series data uh, in, a, in a data lake, essentially using this time series database. And so if you have analytical use cases, you can go in and access all of this historical data as well. And so just a quick overview of the architecture, looking at the left-hand side here, we have devices. So these are sensors, could be turbines, <clears throat> smart meters, electric vehicles, uh, solar panels, these things that are, that are producing data. That data moves into these data stores, different relational databases, could be uh, CSV files on S3, Parquet files, then the platform in the middle using the data virtualization component can go out, connect to those data stores, provide that logical view of your data. You can create data sets within the platform that are tailored to the needs of your data consumers. You can then provide access via REST or JDBC connections to developers, different models and services, or even BI tools like Tableau, different applications, uh, and consume that data and start to work with that data. And at the bottom here, we have these applications, these customer solutions, which PowerBoard is an example of, and I'll get into that uh, in a bit here, but we use the same platform APIs and the same platform interfaces to develop these custom solutions on top of the InterTrust platform. And also, as I mentioned, that secure execution environment, so that uses the same connectivity to the data virtualization service, can consume that data, run these deployments, these different workloads that are being provided by service providers, these applications, those run in the platform, consume data, can write that data back out to different uh, databases that are also governed by the platform. So it creates this nice model for, for running those. And then, as I said, retaining custody of that data. And then obviously on the bottom there, we have our audit service, keeping track and recording of everything that's happening on the platform. So let's get into this RWE offshore renewables use case. And I've been mentoring this PowerBoard application. So Again, one of the tenets of the platform is diverse data landscapes, diverse architectures, lots of different data types. How do you start to manage this, use this, um, and, and sort of wrangle this spaghetti of data that you have? And so within RWE and their offshore uh, operations, they have a similar setup here, right? Some of the project challenges, they have this fragmented data architecture. It's a broad range of different independent systems. So there's some CMS systems. Um, that are uh, they're monitoring <clears throat> the, the workloads and, and things that are happening, the work orders. We have turbine SCADA data that's coming in. So low voltage SCADA data, we have grid connection points, there's high voltage SCADA data, 
There's weather data that's um, important for operations. What is the tide doing? What is the wind doing? What are the waves doing? Because we need vessels to go out and actually service these turbines. Um, so there's difficulty in governing all of these systems because they're all independent. Uh, you know, you have an OEM provided uh, system for the turbines. We have a third party weather data that's being provided by a custom forecast. And you have a different stakeholders. It could be technicians in the field. It could be operators sitting in the control room. It could be a regional or site manager who just needs an overview of the plant and seeing what's going on in the park. Uh, and so, you know, there's a number of data usability issues and requirements, real-time access for operations, these reports for managers, technicians need to see what's going on in the field, uh, watching where vessels are, et cetera. So one of the big challenges was pulling together an interface where you can see all this data because current, prior to the, uh, the actual implementation of PowerBoard, this is what the control room consists of. It's dedicated screens for dedicated systems. So there's a physical manifestation of, this, of these systems. And obviously this is very difficult to, to bounce around and, and jump between. You have technicians uh, responding to alarms at the high voltage system, and then moving back to the low voltage to, to determine what to do or curtail a, a uh, turbine or, or release it for service. So there's, there's physical movement, there's different systems. How can we start to unify that? That was really the challenge. And so the project goals here, we want to enable these different data consumers, whether it be the operators, performance analysts, the management team to discover and use this data more efficiently. We want to create this flex flexible environment that could be adapted to new tools. So if someone comes along with a Python script, someone comes along with a Tableau notebook, someone comes along with a custom performance algorithm, all of these things could be supported by the platform and by the PowerBoard application. So creating a central point of governance as well, because all of these different data systems, determining who should have access to what, if you want to do that independently, you'd be creating users in different databases, uh, moving around or, or maybe like trying to consolidate all of this data into a centralized warehouse. And that may take time. You have ETL processes, uh, all of this work, and it may not even be feasible for some of the data types. Uh, so create the centralized part of, point of governance where you can even grant third parties access to the data, and then just ensure that this is adaptable, scalable, with the goal of improving the operational decision-making. So can we get a better picture, um, provide more timely responses, and operate our farm more efficiently? And so the implementation here, we worked with RWE and some of their counterparts and their IT and engineering team. We, we worked to integrate the different operational systems. As I mentioned, this is the OEM turbine SCADA, the high voltage SCADA, we had works management, which is in, a, in an SAP system. We had a power production forecast that's being provided by a third party provider. There's a VizSim marine management system, which shows technician location via RFID card swipes uh, and this third party weather data. So pulling that all together, then we, we developed and deployed the PowerBoard application on top of the platform. So that enabled this real time monitoring of the operations and maintenance activities. It also provided the ability for historical reporting and was accessible from any web browser or mobile device, which was really important because previously in order to get insight into what was going on in the wind farm, you had to physically call the control room. So call in, get an update. That's where all the systems resided. We blew that away, made it browser accessible, web accessible. You authenticate, you get views into the parks and the screens that you're authorized to view. So this enables this governed consumption of data by the different business and performance analysts, data scientists, application developers. And we can also deploy different performance and anomaly detection models within the secure execution environment. And, and to give a quick overview of the architecture, this is sort of a similar diagram to the one I was showing with the platform, but RWE on the left, we have these different data sources. We're actually acquiring this data to store it for them within the time series database. So the PowerBoard application is responsible for receiving this data, transforming it, we write it to our time series database. On top of that, we've developed APIs and a web app. This is the PowerBoard application, which I'll show in a moment. And in the platform, we create these different data sets that correspond to the underlying data. So the turbines, where the personnel are, uh, work orders, some analysis of the wind turbines, and as I mentioned, we can run these other workloads within the secure execution environment. So a data scientist can publish models, work on notebooks, 
uh, and produce these outputs. And then also all of that data, because it's being governed by the platform, can be consumed via those APIs, REST APIs, or JDBC connections by business analysts or, or whoever's authorized to view that data. So let me jump in now to just quickly show the PowerBoard interface. And let me switch to Chrome quickly. <clears throat> so this is the PowerBoard application. As you can see, we have a, a quite a variety of metrics and data being displayed here. I'll very quickly run through the interface so that uh, you can see what's going on. But here we have the sum of the power that's being produced by the park. We have the capacity factor, which is being calculated. We also include the power price, which is being sourced from a third party. These four tiles on the top here represent the high voltage grid connection points. So these are the, the, the four transform, uh, substations that are offshore. And this is where all of the, the 160 individual turbines uh, in, in grids of four are pumping data, uh, pumping energy into these substations. So we have the actual active power that's being produced on each of these, as well as a power production forecast here in blue. On the right-hand side, we have some weather information, some weather data, so historical wind, historical wave height. We have the tide uh, because the, the way that the port is located, the, the access to the port sometimes is impacted by very high uh, or low tides. Um, so we have that and we also have uh, a forecast. We have observed water and air temperature from the field. And then on the left here, we have a grid of all of the different turbines that are, are running. So you can see the individual turbines. You can actually select turbines to see more detail. You can see the historical active power, reactive power, what the wind speed is being measured by the anemometer on top of the turbine. Um, we have other bits of data, as I mentioned. So there's a vessel management system. So down here, we have data of who has swiped on to this uh, turbine, who's currently on it, what vessel they swiped off of. We have different work orders that have been issued against this particular turbine. Um, and it's, as I said, we're, we're really pulling together a lot of this different information, a lot of this different data. And we designed and worked with RWE and their operators in the control room to develop this interface to meet the needs of how they operate their wind farm. Uh, a couple of other interesting points. So this is the real-time data, but we also provide these daily uh, performance reports, these overviews. So you can see total generation, you can see release of plants that have happened over a, a period of 24 hours for a specific day, <coughs> excuse me. And this was done because they really want some insight into the, the previous day performance to see what was going on, uh, summarize some of these things. And we can show also the maintenance activities. So what work orders were being performed, when the releases were, when they took place, when the release and return times are. So it's able to visualize this as a timeline. And again, you can see here are a number of personnel that were within the uh, operating offshore that day, where they were located. So were they on a vessel? Were they on a vessel and then swiped onto a turbine? Um, so all of this activity is visible uh, for managers, technicians, um, operators to, to consume and, and look at. Um, let me jump back into my deck for a moment. So, you know, what we're looking to do, this is just a, a quote from Justin Grimway, who's the business information manager at RWE. We're really about providing the, the right bits of data to their operations team to make them <clears throat> easier to spot these anomalies, address these actionable items, and again, creating this holistic view of the wind farm and what's going on there. So, uh, you know, it's been a success. They've deployed it to a number of different uh, wind farms uh, within their portfolio and looking to expand that as they bring additional wind farms online moving forward. Um, I wanna to touch on one other use case because it relates to wind, but it's a little bit different. And it's, uh, it's pretty interesting because I think it highlights the, this data custody, the secure execution environment, and just sort of thinking about the use of this data beyond just the operations and maintenance, or maybe you know the concerns of the the wind farm and its operations. So we worked to deliver this parametric insurance uh, yield cover. So we worked with a leading reinsurer who's offering coverage to wind farm owners for certain events that cause generation losses. So it could be a low wind; you're just not getting as much wind 
<clears throat> as you uh, forecast or modeled for that location, there may be um, underperformance by turbines based on the power production curve and, and you're not seeing that. Uh, so there was a number of criteria that the um, insurer was willing to cover based on um, data that's coming off of the turbine. So that's the parametric part. So we wanted to go ingest and store all of this, the turbine data. So we have the SCADA data and we also had the policy configuration details. <clears throat> this required access to some additional third-party data sets like wind data, uh, MERA2, ERA5, because in the event of data outage, these were used as proxy data feeds um, depending on the outage duration. So there was some, there was some um, consideration about the data feeds, the data availability in the policy model as well. And if that data went down for a bit, you'd interpolate. If it went down for a longer bit of time, maybe you'd use these um, forecast models or analysis models as a proxy. And then if data went down for an extended period, you would just omit that period from coverage. So any uh, potential downtime or loss that was, gener that was suffered during the time when data was unavailable would just be uncovered, not covered by the policy. So there was all of this policy settlement logic that was converted into an algorithm. And we developed also this application for, di for displaying this policy status to both the insurer and the policy holder. So again, on the left-hand side, you had the insurer, they provide this policy it goes into the secure execution environment as a computational model. The wind farms providing things like the power curves, the real-time SCADA data, and then you have third-party data, the weather data, weather forecasts, all of that's coming into the platform on a <clears throat> daily basis. The settlement policy is being run. It generates the policy settlement for that day, which is aggregated over the policy settlement period. Uh, and on the right-hand side, you ultimately get a settlement for uh, a yearly um, policy period. And then we can showcase reports around how that was arrived at, what were the daily um, uh, settlement uh, and, and claimed losses. And you can also look into this to audit it if there was a dispute. Again, using some of those audit records and also because all of the data is being stored, we can go in and provide that to a third party if they want to validate the outcome of the policy settlement. So this is just a quick screenshot of some of the uh, UI that we worked to develop. <clears throat> showcasing some of that actual production, expected production, the insured losses for different settlement dates um, and, and looking at how that's uh, being calculated. So with that, I will wrap up, open the floor to any questions. And I see we have a few here in the, in the Q&A. So Pratik. Yeah, uh, so we do have a few questions and um... I'd encourage if uh, you know anybody else if you have questions or if you'd like to even you know have an interaction talk to us just you know use the raise hand function I'll uh, you know enable your microphone so we can have a discussion around it but if you feel comfortable to post more questions into the Q&A section please free, feel free to do that um, so meanwhile yeah we've got a few questions um, first thing um, Chris uh, there's a question around um, you know, whether power board is designed just for wind farms or are there like other use cases for it? Yeah, so power board was originally designed for RWE and some of these use cases um, that are specific to them, but it's just an, it's, it's really just an example of an implementation that you can showcase that can be built on top of the platform. So it could very easily be extended to other IoT devices um, when you think about it, it's a visualization it's expression on top of all the data that's being brought in. So it depends on the needs, um, but it could definitely be extended into other use cases. For example, I think it would have a very good fit with a uh, solar farm, right? Very similar um, types of requirements. You, you may have some solar radiation data from weather. You may have some work orders to go and service those, uh, those um, solar panels the production output, you can track all of these things. So I think it lends itself to other um, renewable generation assets. Um, but it's, it's really, again, I, I think it's, what's interesting is once you have all that data and the ability to, to use it um, in a consistent way in, this, in the InterTrust platform, then it really opens the door into what types of applications you wanna build. And also you, this is a, a sort of a, a very visual interface but behind the scenes, that data is still available. So we can use some of these more general platform 
interfaces, which I didn't get into. So that the platform itself does provide a number of UIs. Um, it will express a data catalog. So the data assets that are actually connected and the data sets that are being published um, by the platform can be consumed uh, like just over JDBC. So if you want to use that data for other applications, uh, it's, it's very easy to access that data. And, and as a data steward, govern who has access to that data. So granting a performance analyst, again, access to that to develop some models is very easy to do. So I think that's really the value is having that connectivity, that connective tissue to, the, to your data. Thanks, Chris. Um, so another thing uh, that's come up in the question is you did mention about real-time SCADA data, and that is extremely valuable, but what can we do uh, for historical data that's coming from, say, IoT sensors and other devices? What can we do with this historical data? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, you know, I think, again, it's the historical data, it depends on the use cases. It's really what I've seen for historical data, the uses of that are primarily for analysis. Um, so if you're looking to develop models that are gonna run on real-time data, having that historical data is really important. And this is actually an area where when some of our experience working with the SCADA data, a lot of organizations will only keep 10 minute data. And so you have this sort of very low resolution when this data is coming off at 10 seconds, but you're actually storing it at 10 minutes, um, you know, data scientists are very hungry for high resolution data. The more data, the better. And so I think what, what, what this has really enabled, um, and this is a key feature, I think, of the time series database that we've developed, is the ability to store this very cost effectively. So you don't have to make that sacrifice and say, we're going to toss all of this data. Um, you can actually keep that data around. And I think that's a very juicy incentive for data scientists because they're always looking for better data, more data, higher resolution data. Uh, particularly for a lot of these um, real-time models, if you're looking for to assess the <clears throat> performance of a turbine or to detect some, some fluctuations, to do some sort of predictive maintenance work, uh, having that historical archive that's very rich can be, a, can be quite valuable. And I think one of the main challenges there is just the storage of this data is, can be very expensive. And that's one of the things that the time series database can help address. That's good. Um... There's one interesting question. Um, how long did it take to develop both applications? And I think the question is around, you know, the R RWE uh, application based on PowerBoard and, um, you know, the parametric insurance as well. Yeah, the PowerBoard application, I would say probably took about, the actual development of the application, probably three to six months. Um, there was a bit more time in, invested into the discovery process, I would say. So we did have site visits. We went out, we talked to the actual operators in the control room. So there was a lot of work there, you know, just sort of back and forth to define what they wanted. Um, and so getting those requirements can take some time as well. But once we had those in hand, um, going out and, and connecting to these data and developing the application is something that we did in, in around six, three to six months. Now we continue to work on the application and work with them to enhance it and improve it. So it's an ongoing process, but uh, you know, that initial delivery was in that, um, in that time span, one to two quarters. And with the parametric insurance, um, I would say it's roughly about the same. And there's kind of a similar engagement where we were working with the reinsurer to understand what they wanted to do. Um, a lot of that time was spent more around um, determining how to model the settlement policy and how to develop these sort of um, edge cases within it. Uh, like I said, so, so data being down for a particular period of time, then we're going to go and reference some third party weather data or omit calculations. So these types of situations, because they were sort of trying to figure out <clears throat> what the, the policy should be, how it should be structured. Um, and so there's a bit of back and forth there, but once that was um, once that was actually resolved, again, I would say around three to six months. Um, there's a question around parametric insurance and um, use cases outside of wind. So could it apply to solar? Yeah, it could apply to solar. Um, it could apply to automotive insurance, right? I mean, there's 
there's uh, we've had conversations with another insurance provider here in the U.S. and they're very interested in you know, car telemetry. And this has been something that we've I think consumers are a bit hesitant uh, around. And there was a model previously where you needed to install some hardware within your vehicle to basically track you to determine you know are you are you speeding are you uh, have rapid decel deceleration rapid acceleration what type of driving behavior do you exhibit and they're you know, extracting this from the telemetry um, but I know of other insurers that have these good behavior programs and if you enable uh, telemetry uh, on a mobile phone so they, they've now moved away from these physical devices installed on the vehicle into an app that's running on your iPhone your, your smartphone um, where you can enable this telemetry and they will reward you for exhibiting good behavior as a driver so there there's ways that you can take data and then start to apply it within these different algorithms. And so I think the parametric insurance has a lot of use cases beyond just wind and, and solar. And you know this is just a particular use case. And that's really, again, one of the ways that we tried to model the InterTrust platform is to enable those services to be deployed against the data. So you can bring those in if you have an idea, uh, it can very easily be deployed. And I guess one interesting side note to that as well, I was just reading a recent story about Tesla. So Tesla is starting to roll out their uh, fully automated driving in a beta. But in order to qualify for that beta, you have to pass their insurance program uh, vetting. So they, they're they using a similar model uh, because they have access to all the data that's uh, basically your Tesla vehicle is reporting. So they can use that to determine if you are a good enough driver to have this beta feature enabled. So it's this really interesting um, use case where you have this, this data-driven service insurance predictor, I, I forget what they call it, but it's essentially evaluating your driving. And if you pass, then they enable this other data-driven <laughs> feature, which is their uh, fully full self-driving capability. So it's, uh, you know, Tesla is sort of leading the way here and they have a great model for it uh, because they control that vertical. They have access to the data, they run the AI, they, they are fully incorporated into that device. And so um, I think that's another sort of interesting use case I just read about a few days ago. Yeah, and they're continuing to add more data points as well, especially for that um, full self-drive. Um, they now would capture data inside the car as well and observe whether you're paying attention or not and things right. like that, right? So right. are you looking would, at the uh, road? Or, yeah. Are you napping? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people have been caught doing that for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, this next question is... Um, a little broad, but uh, let's see how we can handle this. Um, so how is data privacy handled within PowerBoard? So we, it's sort of an interesting use case because you know this is a lot of IoT data. There is some employee data, as you saw in that report, you can see where people are. So as you can see, there's no identifiable information there. We just display these employee numbers. Um, so as someone who's just looking at that screen, there, you can't, um, it's, it's sort of anonymized uh, data. So you can see people are moving around, but you can't see exactly who those people were unless you know what their ID code is. And that was sufficient for RWE's purposes. Um, it's a little bit different in the IoT world because a lot of this stuff is technically not considered personally identifiable information. I mean, the operation of an, a, a turbine or of a substation is not necessarily subject to this. So I think they, they dodge that in a bit. But one of the ways that you know, we look at managing this is in the platform, you can create not only restrictions as to who has access to this data, but you can actually use SQL syntax, and it's a little bit technical, but you can actually use SQL syntax to obfuscate some of this data. So if you want to hash values of say an email address or a person's name, um, you can actually do that when you define the data set. So the platform, as part of that data virtualization capability, you know, we're going out, we're connecting to databases, but what we're exposing are these data sets that are defined by the platform. And the platform allows you in that definition to use a SQL query to sort of rename columns or treat data values in a particular way. So that's one of the ways moving forward, and this is an area where we're, we're developing, we have some active, some features on our roadmap where we wanna provide more data obfuscation, 
ability to tag columns with particular classifiers. So it could be email or PII or address, um, and then have a corresponding policy that determines how to treat that data. And so you want to obfuscate it. If you ever see an email column, we need to hash it. Um, those types of use cases, uh, we look to support very soon in the platform. Awesome, that's great. Um, so I have one last question and I think we still have a couple of minutes. Um, so a lot of weather data is available as open data. Uh, can't I just access that data without Power Board? Uh, yes, so actually we, uh, Intertrust has a service called Planet OS uh, and Planet OS is focused around data as a service for earth observation and weather data. And so we have a lot of weather model data there, including this MERA2 and ERA, ERA5 uh, data sets. We have a GFS model. Um, all of that is available at Planet OS. And what you do there, you can sign up, you'll get an API key, and then you can perform REST APIs against those data sets, get that data back. Now, now why do we do that? Um, a lot of this data is actually, it's open data. It's freely accessible, but it's very difficult to find if you're not a domain expert. It's typically buried in some type of FTP repository. Um, they're often stored in some very specific uh, scientific formats because it's really designed to be archived. It's not really designed to be operationalized. And so Planet OS goes and actually acquires the data from these repositories and makes it very easy to make REST API calls. So if you're a programmer, you can get access to this data very easily without having to deal with um, net CDF files or like finding where this data is and it's poorly documented. So we really streamline that data access. And that's why I say it's data as a service. Um, and we're actually working with NREL. Um, and this is a, sort of a sneak peek. I think they're, they're releasing this uh, open OA tool uh, very soon, or they have it uh, already released, but what they're going to be doing is incorporating some of these Planet OS APIs in their um, repository in GitHub. So if you're running this software, uh, it's going to make it very easy to get access to the MERA2 and ERA5 data. So if that's of interest um, to anyone on this call, I, I encourage you to check out the Intertrust website, Planet OS offering there. Uh, because I think it's it's uh, pretty interesting if you're looking to get access to um, these types of data sets. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, that was our last question, um, and we are right about time. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. If, uh, if there's any other questions, uh, please let us know. Uh, drop it into the chat window or Q&A, and uh, we can definitely get back to you. Uh, if you found the session helpful, I'd really like uh, to know. and. You know, the chat box is again a great way for uh, us to know that. If you liked it, um, drop a thumbs up in the chat. It just helps us know whether this was useful to you or not. Um, if there are other things you would like us to talk about um, around this space, uh, we're happy to um, do that as well. There's another session coming up in about a couple of weeks where we'll talk about primarily our clean grid application, which is essentially helping energy companies, utility companies, and city planners um, you know, accelerate EV infrastructure planning. And um, we can actually help you bring down your EV uh, infrastructure planning time down by 90%. So you could move a lot faster. And, you know, the world is moving to, uh, uh, you know, a stage where there'll be a lot more EV cars pretty soon. And um, we can help you be better prepared for that. So if, if that's a session that um, you think you'd find helpful, uh, please go ahead and let us know in the chat as well. But otherwise, thank you so much, um, everybody, for taking time and joining us today. And thank you, Chris. Uh, as always, uh, you did a great presentation. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Great evening. Thanks. Bye-bye.